Okay, I think we're going to get started, folks. First of all, may I warmly welcome you to another uh, event of the North Front Entrepreneur Alliance. We're excited to have you here. I think, uh, as is the case in the past, I think you're going to get a lot out of today's meeting. Uh, as far as the Entrepreneur Alliance, you can read as well as, as I can talk, but we were founded in 2008. You can see the reasons here as far as what our goals are. We want you to have an opportunity to network, first of all, to learn, which is why we bring in speakers like we have today. We want you to share ideas with us, find the resources that you might need to help you get started or grow a uh, early stage business. And at the same time, then, at least once a year, we want to take an opportunity to recognize your accomplishments. We do that through our awards presentation every December. So if you haven't got that one on your calendar, Leave a spot, check with northfront.org, get a date, because I think you'd enjoy seeing uh, a recognition of some of the uh, outstanding companies that get started every year. Now, as we move into the, uh, the highlight of our day with, with Rick Allen, we have, uh, since this organization was founded, Rick has been at the top of our list for speakers that we wanted to get here. And, uh, and we have accomplished that today. And uh, I'm grateful for that. I want to thank Alan Hall and his influence for helping in that endeavor as well. Um, Alan obviously has been a, a great supporter of the North Front Entrepreneur Alliance for a long, long time. Let me tell you a little bit about Rick. He was founded at uh, the Skull Candy, uh, which most of us are, are certainly aware of why we're here, in January of 2003, and currently serves as a member of the Board of Directors. Uh, from the founding of Skull Candy up until March in 2011, Rick served as his chief executive officer. Prior to founding Skull Candy, he founded Device Manufacturing, Snowboard, Boot, and Binding Company, and later sold to the Atomic Ski Company. In 1986, Rick co founded National Snowboard, a snowboard events and marketing company which was acquired by the American Ski Association in 1991. Rick remains active in various entrepreneurial endeavors, including serving on the board of directors of both Stance, an action sports-inspired men's hosiery company, and Celtech, an action sports apparel company. He holds a BS from the University of Chicago, or Chicago, Colorado. <laughs> oh, my goodness, too buff, huh? Uh, one thing I would ask, we have had an opportunity over the, the last two years to have some great speakers in here, and they are full of information, they've got experience that most of us would like to tap, and we'd like to have an opportunity to network to get some of that. Rick is certainly willing to do that, as have our other speakers. Yeah. We have taken an internal policy here at the North Front Entrepreneur Alliance, and we would ask that while we encourage you to come up and talk to Rick, with one thing we would ask you not to do, and that's ask him to be a capital contributor to your business. <laughs> okay? And uh, because that many times happens, we know that when it comes to starting a business, Probably one of the greatest challenges any of you face is raising capital. We recognize that, so does Rick. We just don't want his time spent here trying to uh, ferret through all the companies that would like to have some of Rick's uh, investment capital. I don't even know if he has any at this point. <laughs> and, uh, and he doesn't either. <laughs> so, so ask your questions, but let's, let's steer clear of the, the funding element. Okay? So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Rick and I look forward to his comments just as you are. Rick? So uh, I don't think this mic was tested. They had me clip it on. I can tell already it's not working. Am I supposed to? Uh, and check, check. Anybody? Yeah, it's working? Hey, we got, we got sound, everything, tech, everything. So when I was walking in here, uh, I saw about a dozen guys that I know. And as I'm looking out at the audience, I see way more than that. So I'm curious, how many of you guys have heard me present or speak or something before? Yeah, you see, that's a problem. I'm going to have to ask all you guys to go. Because uh, <laughs> I only have a couple of stories, and you guys have already heard them. So uh, I don't know how to get more original than just tell the same stories over and over and over again, which is why I can't talk any of my friends or wife or anybody else into coming to these things anymore, because uh, I'm surprised that I even stay awake for this stuff uh, <laughs> at this point. But uh, it's, it's really an honor to be asked to come and uh, present. I happen to, uh, for those of you who have heard me before, you've heard me say, 
I happen to have a uh, fairly dysfunctionally high opinion of entrepreneurship, um, particularly of entrepreneurs. Uh, this is the lifeblood of any economy. This is the backbone of economy. This is where problems are solved. This is where problems are even identified. I mean, how many of you even knew that you needed a different pair of headphones than the ones you guys were using before, huh? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you don't know. I, I, that's what entrepreneurship is all about. It's finding a problem and finding a commercial way to solve it and then scaling that, figuring out, you know, uh, finding a problem that is solved by, that needs to be solved by many people. Uh, I, I, Damon, I, I, Damon, I think already took off. Damon and I had a chance to uh, sit and listen to a guy present a product. It was, I gotta tell you, it's pretty badass. It was a cool product, amazing product. Handcrafted, it was this, it was made here in Utah. In fact, uh, I wonder if you, any of you guys remember the name because I don't remember it. Uh, it was a company that made cameras for race cars. Do you guys know what company I'm talking about? They were handcrafted. He, he had like this stainless steel cool case. He'd open up the lid and uh, you know, inside would be cameras and, and little monitors and stuff. And just looking in the box, you knew you wanted one of these things bad. You didn't know why you wanted it, but man, you wanted one of these things bad. And he'd explain what the product was. He says, you know, because he's got six of these handcrafted cameras, one that you'd put on each of the corners of your car and then one on the sides of your car so that while you're driving, you mount these monitors you know, on your dash so that you can see where all the people are around you in the race car situation. And uh, shockingly, this guy wasn't selling a ton of this stuff. Because, yeah, I mean, this was, this was cool. This thing was super cool. And Damon had this great line as we walked out of there. He says, you know what that is? That is a solution screaming for a problem. <laughs> it's just, you know, you got to find a problem that people have, you know, that, that they need solved. And uh, you figure out how to, how to solve that problem. You need to figure out how to solve it with, uh, you know, most importantly with fat margin. Because, man, you know, there is, margin is not a bad word, guys. This is a, profit is a really good word. Figure out how to, uh, wait, how's it go? It's uh, buy low, sell high. Something to that effect. It's a simple formula. Simple formula. Um, the, one of the big challenges this guy had is that he was literally hand making these things, crafting them in his home here in Utah and scrap problems and you know just the cost of manufacturing and everything was uncontrollable and I'm curious, are any of you guys engineers? Whew, dude, I feel bad for you guys because uh, an engineer in an entrepreneurial forum that's a hard, that's a hard run uh, and this guy was an engineer What's the problem with an engineer? The problem with an engineer is they see all the problems and they want to solve all of the problems. Think it to death. Think it to death. What do they call it? It's paralysis by analysis. You know, it's uh, these guys. Uh, the problem with you never want to have a, an engineer as a sales guy because what an engineer will do is he will tell you all the problems they're going to solve in the next version of the product that's going to come out. And all the customers that are standing there listening to the engineer talk about all the problems there. And what he's really hearing is, these are all the problems we're not solving for you today. Guys, that's what version 2.0 is. It's called get to market, iterate later. There's a reason why they have 2013 model cars that are going to completely embarrass that 2012 you just bought this year. It's, uh, you got, you got to get to market. Engineers never seem to be able to get to market. All they seem to be able to do is engineer. And uh, there's always more problems than engineer. But you get good enough for market, you get a good enough margin, and you get to market. And it's all about getting to market. First one to revenue wins. Um, I was asked, uh, was it Ingrid? Was that the nice name on a woman that hit me? At? Was it Ingrid? Hi, Ingrid. <laughs> Ingrid asked me a question before we came in here. She said, uh, we, we, before you started Skull Candy, uh, did you have a problem with uh, too many ideas, like sifting through which idea you were going to come up with? And uh, you know something, when I started Skull Candy, I will go, this thing's going to last about four minutes and then I'm going to go into Q&A because I'd much rather know what you guys want to hear about than uh, force feed you into just something that, I, that I'm getting into. But um, I was actually working on an entirely different product. Um, I'm always a believer that if you've got a good idea for a product, 
How many of you guys, I don't even ask, need to ask, it's rhetorical. Everybody that has a great idea and they think, I might want to take that thing to market. The first thing you do is go, I'm not telling anybody. Can't tell anybody. Where's the non-disclosure? Where's the non-compete? If I'm talking to somebody, you're terrified to tell anybody. Because Catherine, somebody's going to steal your idea, right? Whatever it is you got, you don't want somebody to be stealing that thing from you. And everybody's got this idea that I've got to be protective. I just think that's the worst possible case. It's the worst thing you can do. As soon as you get an idea, tell everybody. Don't tell the guy that could actually do something with it, like your competitor. You know, don't talk to those guys. But trust me, every, if, if, there's nobody in this room that's going to steal your idea. There's nobody in your family that's going to steal your idea. None of your neighbors, none of the people that you probably associate with a, have any ability to steal your idea because they all have jobs and B, they got all their own ideas that they're worried about somebody else stealing. And so everybody's already occupied with whatever their other projects are. Which kind of takes you back to the idea, have you guys ever, have any of you guys ever, because I've done this a bunch, ever had an idea and gone out and presented it to a person or to a company to try and get them to buy that idea? Not a company, but just an idea. It just doesn't work, guys. You, you, you can't take that great idea you've got and take it to Burton Snowboards or take it to Ford and take it to somebody else and say, hey, man, I've got a better idea of how to uh, attach a wheel to a car you know, or attach a boot to a binding. They don't buy that stuff. They've got full staffs of people that are, A, already preoccupied with the projects they're already building, and B, it's their job to be coming up with the ideas, and the, people get paranoid. They, if they gotta go outside to buy the ideas, people behave the worst possible way they possibly can. Doesn't matter how much better your idea than their idea is, trust me, nobody's, A, stealing your idea, or B, gonna take your idea and bring it to market for you. If you want your idea to market, Get your ass busy and go take it to market. Go do it yourself, because it's the only way it's ever gonna happen. So if you got the passion for it, if you got the ability to do it, go do it, because nobody else is gonna do it. So all of this is coming up to, so I had an idea. And so the idea was at that time, the, the, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever in any of these forums, I'm trying to think of some unique story I haven't told, so you guys the, you know, uh, don't feel too duplicated on this whole thing. But the idea was this. I had, I've still actually I didn't have, I, I, I still have kids uh, and they were approaching driving age and I saw this. There is no excuse in the world for any 16 year old, 17 year old male to survive their driving years. <laughs> I, I, there's n and nobody that drives next to them should ever survive it. We all think we are great drivers. But I, boy, I look back, there's no way I should have ever survived my 16th and 17th years of life. It's shocking. In every first world country, every first world country, the uh, mortality rates of virtually every age group is increasing. We used to live till we were 45s and then 60s, and now it's up into the 70s. We're all getting older. We've got better medicine. We have better health. We all, you know, everything's better. We're all staying healthier longer. We're living longer. There is one demographic that is going down. 16 to 18 year old males. And the number one cause of death, car accidents. And they're not even multi-car accidents. They're single car accidents. They are, you are such a bad driver, you couldn't even hit another car accidents. They are typically speeding around a corner, catching some gravel and hitting a tree. And how many of us know of a 16 or 17 year old guy that has either been killed or has killed other passengers in his car? I mean, put your hand up. If you know anybody in that cat, everybody does. It's a horrible tragedy. So we had had that happen. We had a friend of ours whose uh, son was killed in a car accident. I thought, you know something? I'll bet you we can find a way to solve this. And I was driving down the road. I had just gotten my first, I, I, I didn't even need this fishing pole, but I found there was this fishing rod for sale. And if you bought this fishing rod, and it was freaking expensive. It was a spendy rod. But if you bought it, you got a free GPS unit with your rod. That's how expensive it was. And so this was like 1998, 90, yeah, 97, 98, something like this. And so I am driving home. I had it shipped to my office. I'm driving home from work, doing about 80. And I, well, I can tell you, I was 
driving 72 because as soon as I got the package, I'm driving down the road, I think I'm talking on my phone and unpackaging the GPS and getting the batteries put into it. I shouldn't have even survived like my 35th year of driving because this is how bad I am. And I fire the thing up and I'm holding it and it gets one satellite, two satellite, and as soon as it gets enough satellites, it tells me how fast I'm going. This is the first time I've ever held a GPS and I see this thing and it's telling me, I'm going 72 miles per hour. This is really cool. And that struck me. You put a GPS inside the car that would rate how fast somebody's driving, how fast they brake, how fast they accelerate, how fast they go around corners. And you have this thing as a mentoring system to teach teenagers how to be better drivers. And most importantly, if, it is, if, if they're speeding, it would then immediately send some sort of a, back then the concept was it would send a text out to a, uh, to a beeper. You know, the parents would have to have a pager because that's what, it, what, you know, that's what was all the rage. We, you know, we all had pagers back then, right? But uh, nowadays it would send a text or a phone call saying, your kid is speeding right now. And what teenager would be speeding if he knew that his mom was about to get a text. So, you know, this was the concept. So in about 1990, that was, you know, uh, late 90s. So I decided this is the product I'm bringing to market. This is the one I'm gonna to take to market. And so uh, I am off trying to source in the year 2000 and the year 2001. I'm trying to find somebody, because you may have heard, I've got like a Bachelor of Science from, in political science from university, from the state school. Uh, it doesn't exactly qualify me for GPS technology development. Uh, this is, it doesn't qualify me for anything but self-employment. It's <laughs> it, it, many times self-unemployment. You know, it's, it's not a great degree to go get you ready for the world. But it got me out of school and I got a degree. And uh, so I'm looking for someone that can develop this thing for me. And in the early 2000s, coming up with GPS technology, it was impossible. It was taking forever, taking forever. So it was the 2000. Two, January 2002, I'm at the uh, Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. And I am there specifically trying to source uh, engineering resources for this GPS. Uh, we were calling it uh, the Guardian Technologies. That's the, that was the, the name that we came up with, was Guardian Technologies. And by we, what I really mean is me, because it makes you sound like you're bigger than just you, you know, hanging out at home. So uh, I, I'm, at, I'm there trying to source it. And if you ever need to figure out where to source a product, it's not rocket science, guys. You need to figure out how to make a gas can or a medical device or clothing or a GPS technology or a pair of headphones or a pair of socks. You just go to the trade shows that for that industry, and there's always these great Chinese uh, sourcing sections of the, of the shows, and you show up and you walk around and you do through, we call them Chinaville. You walk around Chinaville and you get, uh, you see what all their different goods are, and if they happen to be GPS experts, they'll have GPS devices in their booths, and you stop and say, I'm looking for a guy like you. Um, so I'm walking around really having very little, excuse me, very little success trying to find a GPS source, and uh, I wander by a, um, a booth in, in the China sourcing area that made both stereo headphones and hands-free devices for cell phones. They just made, and they made all kinds of different wired audio devices. And I sat there and I looked at it and I thought, you know something, several years ago, I was sitting on a chairlift uh, happened to have been here at Park City, and I was sitting on a chairlift. I always snowboard with music. I've always got my headphones on. And I, you know, was listening to my music that day, and uh, somewhere for about the tenth time that day, sitting on the chairlift, my phone is ringing off the hook yet again. And while I'm pulling the headphones off my head, I'm pulling my glove off and trying to get into my pocket fast enough to get my phone out to take the call. I think to myself. You know, this is stupid. It couldn't be that tough to put two plugs under the end of a pair of headphones. One for your music player, one for your cell phone. And man, wouldn't that be great? You'd solve all kinds of problems that you didn't even know you had. So uh, I went home and I always keep a, uh, I, I used to keep a file called uh, Wouldn't It Be Cool? And uh, that's where I would put ideas. I always like to keep all of my ideas in because Ingrid, trust me, we're all so flooded with all these ideas. And what an amazing world that we live in. What a great piece of our evolutionary DNA, however it comes to us, that we have ideas. We have the, the ability for unique thought. And we can think of things to solve problems that we didn't even know that we had. Uh, this is really unique in, 
you know, this species that we can think of things like this. And so let's not waste it. You know, how many times every one of us have had that amazing idea that's going to change the world and you're 24 hours later and you just cannot remember what it was that got you so excited the day before. And so I'm tired of losing these ideas. So I always keep them written down, put them into a journal. I, right now I uh, text myself uh, so the text goes into my phone. So next time I'm sitting in front of my computer, I record whatever my thoughts are into the computer. So years earlier, I had had this idea. Now I'm walking around looking for GPS things. And uh, are you getting as much scratching out of this as I'm getting? Sorry about that. Um, I figure it's probably not one of you guys causing all that noise. Um, <laughs> the, um, I walked by this booth and I thought, wow, several years ago I thought about a pair of headphones and he makes headphones that would incorporate in uh, a cell phone and he makes you know, hands-free devices for cell phones. I wonder if he could put those together and I'm here. I may as well go in there and see if he can make me one of those. I was there on an entirely different trip. I was there to do this Guardian technology, this great GPS thing that'll change the world. And so I sit down with the guys and you know, I'm as paranoid as anybody else, especially around uh, Chinese factories and knowing that it's completely in vain. I had him sign an NDA. Uh, trust me, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. But had him sign an NDA and I told him my idea and they kind of yin and yang back and forth to each other and they said, yeah, we think that we could probably make you one of those things. 30 days later, I get this package from these guys and I have my first working prototype of what soon became the Skullcandy Link technology. And I thought, this is so cool. This is so amazing. All I wanted every day was to be listening to my music. And now I'm begging somebody to call me. I don't have nearly enough friends in the world <laughs> to call me as often as I wanted to get called. Because it was so cool to have your headphones on, ha listening to the music, and then all of a sudden your phone's ringing into your headphones. And you're listening to your music, and your phone's ringing, and you push the button, and now you're listening to the guy talk, and you're talking to him. And completely unbeknown to it, it wasn't part of the plan, but it became a great part of the plan. The music kept on playing, because I'd never thought about the fact that you can't pause uh, a CD player from this button. Or, uh, you know, I think I was using a cassette deck or something back then. You can't pause that device. So the music would keep playing in the headphones while you're talking to the guy. And you could either turn the music down and listen more intently or, you know, turn it up and, you know, disregard whatever was going on. You listen to the music and the guy has no idea you're listening to the music while you're talking to the guy. And it was great. And I thought to myself two things. Dude, wouldn't it be cool? And 30 days to my first working prototype, that's the golden rule. First one to revenue wins. Get to market fast. And I suddenly realized I could get this thing to market way faster than I'll be able to get this GPS product to the market. And so immediately GPS went full back burner, headphones became the central preoccupation of my life and uh, that was January of 2002. January of 2003 at the exact same trade show, we launched with our first 10 by 20 booth with big skull candy sign, music and you know, speakers up way too loud and some really cool headphones and we launched 12 months later. Skull Candy. First product that we launched, because I think it's super important. If you're just doing another version of your competitor's product, you don't need to be in the market and they don't need to worry about you. It's really important for me that your product is disruptive and it's differentiated. This is a product that did something different than any other headphones out there. I'm just curious, how many people in this room currently own headphones? And let me try this again. Who in this room does not own a pair of headphones? Now, really? I gotta tell you, you put enough people in a room and you get that one guy. <laughs> There's that, you know, I gotta tell you. And so I always come prepared to take care of the guy. Would you hand that back to him, please? Now, there's nobody in the room that doesn't have a pair of headphones, okay? Now, don't you wanna sell to that many people? There's a lot of people that use headphones, right? Now, I'm curious, out of all you people that own headphones, how many of you have a pair of headphones with two plugs on the end of it? No, there's only one on that one, sorry. <laughs> it was a great technology before MP3 players were integrated into a cell phone. And so when I was out starting the thing up, they said, you know something, they're starting to put music players inside cell phones and I'm just going, cool, that means I can get rid of one of these plugs. 
you know, I always knew we were going to eventually see this integration and we'd go that direction. But I'll bet you that uh, I'm not alone in the room that I had a, a pair of, uh, or excuse me, a snow helmet because where we really found this worked great. We met with uh, Jiro Helmets and we said, hey guys, you got to put speakers in your helmets. And not only that, but it wouldn't just play music. I can put cell phones and music into the helmets. And they freaked out. They said, beautiful. And so we started doing snowboard and ski helmets with this link technology. Did any of you guys ever have a, a snow helmet? <clears throat> Excuse me, a snow helmet that had two plugs on it? See a few of us. There we go. No more. We still put tons of audio into helmets, but it's just one plug now. Who needs two plugs? So we, uh, you know, you, you launch, you get to market, and you iterate later. You go to 2.0 down the road. But, dude, I still want to make this GPS thing. I, I still think it would be a great product. I really think this is something that would work. I always think that uh, entrepreneurship requires two really key elements. Inspiration, desperation. You got to have that aha moment. Oh, dude, I'm driving down the road. I'm going 72 miles per hour. Oh, dude, I got an idea. If I ever wrote a book, I'm going to call it, dude, I got an idea. Because <laughs> that's what I think every great conversation in entrepreneurship always starts with the same words. Dude, dude. anything that is of worth starts with that <laughs> word in my personal <laughs> vernacular. <laughs> anyway, there's also been a lot of injuries in my life that has started out with, Dude, yeah, and so uh, you know it goes goes both ways, but it's fun up until that moment. You know, there's been a lot of entrepreneurial injuries in my life as well, but uh, you you know you you launch, you get started, you get going, and um, you know okay, so I started going. So inspiration, you got to have that aha moment. We've all had it. Then there's desperation. A lot of people say perspiration that come down the road, but honestly. I'm, you've got to be driven. Who on earth would do this on purpose? Who would do this without some... I, I mean, I saw this great quote on the wall out here. It said, uh, an entrepreneur is somebody that gives up the 40-hour 40 40 a week safety. Uh, do you know the quote? Yeah, well, I can't. Ah, read the wall on the way out, okay? <laughs> it says, everything safe and secure and everything your mom told you to do you probably ought to do that instead because entrepreneurship is just what your mom, your mom spends her whole life trying to keep you out of harm's way. How to, of teaching you to avoid risk. What did your mom say every time you said, dude? She said, be careful. <laughs> this is, there's nothing about entrepreneurship that involves being careful. That's not what we're here doing. Everything about anything that follows the word dude involves risk. Everything that's involved in entrepreneurship involves risk, and that's everything your mom told you not to do. It's a, we're, we are counterculture. We are a different kind of people. Some of us do it just because we're entirely unemployable in any other respectable way in our life. <laughs> and I know there are some of you that agree with me and say, you're in this room for the same reason. I make a terrible employee. Man, I am the worst employee. I just uh, recently, met a guy. You know what's cool about coming and doing this kind of thing? I just broke the surprise. Oh. You guys got me a gift. That's so cool. It was over here by the water bottle. Sorry, I already saw it. So. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, we'll get to that part later. Um, I met this guy a little while ago named Jeff Tabin. Have you, any of you guys ever heard of a rock climber named Jeff Tabin? This is a unique guy. This is a guy that's solving real problems. The problems I've always set my, set my sights on have been things like, <sighs> the problems I need to solve in my life is I've got this really super cute wife and I gotta keep her. That's a problem in my life. <laughs> I gotta keep my wife, I gotta care for my kids, and I've always said, provide for your family, pay off your house. That's been my mission in my life. Because I'm in the snow industry. The snow industry, you get, how many months of snow? This year? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. How many, how many months a year? Twelve. How many months of snow? Four. Now go into that business. You're going to get four months of revenue, two months at full price, two months at clearance price, and then you've got another eight months of overhead with no revenue. That's the way the snow business works. And so my whole life in the snow business has been never take debt because you can't make your payments come June. I mean, you can't, you have no more money left. 
And so it was pay off everything as fast as you can. When you've got the money, pay it off. That's just kind of the way the snow industry worked for me. And so uh, I can't remember why I started talking about snow. Oh, Jeff, there we go. I got this book in my hand. Um, I also believe that entrepreneurship is built on ADD. Uh, I think it's a really <laughs> positive thing. I've never been diagnosed with it, but I'm confident I have it. And, uh, and I don't medicate because I really like it. So it's working for me. So, uh, but Jeff Tabin, this is a guy that I met. He, he's this rock. He sets his sights on much higher problems. He sees that there are whole cultures that are dying way too young for super, you know, solvable reasons. Cataracts. So he went over and he started the Himalayan Cataract Project. His whole thing is, I'm never going to miss a day of climbing for a day of work. You know, that, that would just be, why would you miss that opportunity? And if he can go to, the, go to the Himalayas and climb and solve problems at the same time, that is a great life. And so this guy has almost single-handedly solved blindness, resolved blindness in, uh, in uh, Nepal. Um, when, I found, when I first met him, what went through my mind is, I'm also a rock climber, what went through my mind is, I want to go to Nepal with this guy because I could probably meet all the right guys. So I said, hey, Jeff, the next time you're going over, I know you take uh, you know, volunteers. I'd love to go with you. I'll pay my own way. I'll be, but you, whatever. I don't know how to cut guys' eyes and stuff, but I, I can do all the other stuff. I'll carry bags. I'll help out. And he says, you know something, Rick? We've set, we have trained so many doctors in Nepal that I'm kind of unneeded anymore. Now I just go visit friends, but there are so many clinics that we've opened and so many doctors that we've trained to do the surgery over there, Nepalese doctors that are trained to do the surgery. I'm kind of, I, I, they don't need me anymore. They're better than most of the, uh, the surgeons that are here in the United States because we trained them. We solved that problem. It's done. How many people in the world can say, no, 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 we solved that problem in Nepal. It doesn't exist anymore. He says, now we're going to Africa and we're in this country and that country and none of these countries interested me at all. So I said, I'm out. So uh, I don't want to help. Uh, so I'm actually going. Jeff has set up this great trip. We're going over to Nepal to go uh, climbing in, uh, in May. So we go over and I'm going to be, spend the, the month of May over there. And he set up this amazing trip. And he gave me this great book that he, read, that he wrote uh, called Blind Corners about literally it's he doesn't say it's about solving blindness in these third world countries but that's what this book is all about read it it's a fantastic book but early on i read this really great quote and i realized wow i i think there's uh there's a carryover from adventure and adventurous life to entrepreneurship and so i've never done this out loud so this could be a total flop and I might get it all wrong but work this through with me um, Jeff is talking about his chapter one is a quest for adventure and he says uh, I like a good adventure he says the satisfaction of turning blind corners what's a blind corner something you don't you have no idea what's coming you have no idea what's coming at you you better be ready for it but you have no idea what's coming at you to sound like entrepreneurship don't we spend our whole lives just trying to solve the problems that we didn't know what that were coming after us he says the satisfaction of turning blind corners relying on wits and skills to succeed is to me the essence of adventure in our mechanized world of processed food electric socks and in-flight entertainment real adventures can be difficult to find the expanding adventure travel industry offers exotic and sometimes strenuous trips all over the world. You guys have heard of these groups that you pay them enough money, they will literally tow you to the top of Everest. They'll take you to the top of whatever mountain, whatever. You, you, you want to go skydiving? You don't even know how to use the chute. You just strap yourself to me and I'll take you down. You just hang on, you know. It, it, these are these mechanized adventure groups that will take you on an adventure. He says, uh, they do not offer adventure. Your guide makes the decisions. Your guide ensures your safety. Now that sounds to me like employment. You know, your boss, your boss makes your decisions and your boss ensures your safety. Now reality is, I think for any of us that have ever had a boss, that's not really, he's ensuring his own safety. You know, I think it's a different program, but pay your fee and enjoy the ride. In our litigious society, the outcome must never be left to doubt. Um, feels a little bit like entrepreneurship, right? 
it says, uh, but then again, if you don't take a risk, you won't get hurt. So that 40 hour a week job thing, you can get hurt, a lot of people. Any of you guys ever been laid off? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you, there, not everything. And without a doubt, somebody strapped to somebody else's parachute, and that guy making all the decisions, he didn't make all the right decisions every time. Somebody's been hurt. You know, you can't always rely on somebody else making the right decisions. Absolutely, guys that have been trying to get up to Everest who have paid, you know, 100,000 bucks to get at the top of Everest have not come home because their guides have made the wrong decisions. But then uh, he gets down here. It's funny because as I read this, do you guys ever, you guys ever been heli boarding before, heli skiing? You guys ever hired a guy? Have you ever been cat skiing? We have a guide. How many of you guys have it? I, I seriously want to see you, because I, I don't know who I'm talking to. How many people have hired a guide to go into the backcountry? So a group of us. I spent all my life trying to figure out how to get back into the backcountry. And there are some specific areas that I go that, that I, I figure every time I go back to that area, I have made, whenever I pull into the right parking lots, I immediately sit and I think to myself, I made some good decisions this week. You know, whatever it was that got me back to those parking lots, those were good decisions. Whatever it took to get back to those parking lots. So, Alaska. If you've, if you've ever been to Alaska, um, anybody ever been heli skiing or heli boarding in Alaska? I like you. I don't even know your name, but I already like you. What is it? You know my name, but what's <laughs> I know that accent. Um, there's nothing like standing up on top of uh, these sharp peaks in Alaska. The first time a helicopter ever dropped me off. I mean, I'm thinking, one thing about a guide, and this is just hot tip for any of you who will ever go out with a guide. Here's the hot tip with a guide. Your first run or two, don't fall. Because it's just, it's an audition. Everybody calls them the audition runs. The guides won't say, okay, for our audition runs today, I'm going to take you up on some really mellow 32 to 35 degree slopes just to see what I've gotten myself into today. That's not how it is, but that's what it is. They're taking you out because they don't know you. They don't know what, they, what your skill set is. They don't know how good you can ride. You put on the form, I'm so bad, man. You can't even imagine how good I ride. I'm better than all my buddies. I went down to Black Diamond once. I mean, it's a, you have no idea. Everybody writes whatever they're going to write on those forms. It says, I can do what I'm up here paying you to do. You can't imagine how many guys get up on top of that hill and have no business being up there. It doesn't matter how much money they paid. That guide, is, they're in a lot of trouble. And the guide doesn't want to be in trouble on top of these peaks. So typically, you get these audition runs. So I'm thinking, all right, well, it's day one Alaska, my first trip ever to Alaska, and me and my buddies, we've spent, oh man, we saved, and we've got, so it's expensive. So we are up there, and he's flying around, trying to pick a spot, pick a spot, and all of a sudden, he, the, the helicopter goes from this kind of level flight, peeking out, and we're just going, man, where's it gonna be, where's it gonna be, where are we gonna land? And all of a sudden, the chopper just goes, super committed, and he gets right up, and we don't know where he's going, because for sure, he's not going where that helicopter's pointing. And he brings this out and the, the place he lands the helicopter is a little bit wider than the top of this chair. I mean, it is literally the top of this peak and it's like a thousand feet of rock down one side and the helicopter doesn't land. It literally just goes down and hovers with the uh, skids just touching the top of the snow. And when you step out, one step down puts you about four feet underneath the helicopter because it's so steep on the snow side, that the part that you're going to ride down. And you're looking up and they're handing gear down to you out of the chopper. And you are thinking, I am so glad I brought two pair of pants on this trip <laughs> because I should have packed them in my bag right now. And I couldn't believe where he had us standing. And that chopper literally just goes, it, it, he's gone. It's amazing. And you're out there and you're just thinking, this is what I paid for. This is the coolest thing in the world. And then the guide comes into it. Everything in nature does what nature intends it to do. Rocks fall, fish swim, you know, husbands leave their stuff out. We, I mean, nature just, <laughs> entrepreneurs risk. That's what we do. And guides, they guide. And so as soon as you got a guide in the scenario, the guide immediately says, okay, stop, put your board on. It's like, wow, 
wow, okay, I wasn't going anywhere, and I know how to put my board on. I figure we're at the top. I probably ought to do that. And he says, okay, you stay here. You stay there. We're going to ride down. We're going to go down seven turns, and we're going to stop on top of that rock. All right, seven. He, he numbered my turn. And we're down, and we're down on top of the rock. And he holds up. And then the last guy, group up, group up. Guides guide. And they are constantly telling you, stop, go, put your gear on, take your gear off. You are just be every decision has now been removed from this adventure. And I am realizing really fast, oh yeah, I forgot. I hate guides. I hate guides. Because this is all you do. You hear them all day long. You just, they're just yappy, 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 yappy. And we're so acclimated, me and my, these guys that we're up there with, we're so acclimated to having to make these decisions ourselves in the back country. We've already got this. We don't need you to tell us this is a 42 degree pitch because we already seen 42 degrees so many times in our lives. We know where we are. But it's his job. We paid him to get us up there and I can't get up there without him. It's a guide and he's going to take all of the, and there's no adventure and it's, it hurts me. So we go back and what we really like to do is go in the back country where there are no guides. Nobody tells us when to stop. Nobody tells us when to group up. Nobody tells us where to go. We got this. And that to me, I started realizing, I think when I was reading this book, I think that's why I like entrepreneurship. I kind of like the risk of, yeah, we've been hurt. We've had to get guys out of the back country. I mean, I've bled more times. I mean, I, everybody bleeds in the back country and everybody bleeds in entrepreneurship. We all take a risk and we go out and fight and we do, as, do the best we can. But if you want a guide, get a job. You know, if you want some adventure, if you want to take a risk, start a job. Start something. You know, find some passion. Get it all heated up. Get your boys together. Get the crew together. Dude, I got an idea. Let's do this. This will be great. Let's go do this thing. And people just get fired up. And you put enough passion behind it, and you put enough desperation that I have got to get this product to market. I have got to do this thing. You do that, you're going to be successful. You get all that fired up energy, and you just understand the risk. You know where you are. But uh, let me share this one other, uh, little piece with you. He says, uh, I agreed to join a climber, Bob Shapiro, on an illegal excursion to scale a death wall in the middle of a jungle. He says, so listen, that sounds to me a lot like starting a business. You know? <laughs> it, that, that rings to me. He says, uh, but, and I love this, when I first started my first business, I was still in college. That to me was the whole mission there, the problem I was solving is how do I pay for my next semester? Everything was about how do I pay for the next semester at college? That's what my motivation was, is how do I pay? And, but one thing I always knew is, I don't know a thing. I don't know anything. I don't know how to do anything. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know who to call. I don't know how, I, I didn't know anything. And I was always acutely aware of the fact, I'm 21 years old and I do not have a clue. I have a need, but I don't have a clue. And I always, when I was with guys that knew, when I was with guys that had a clue, Turns out they have a word for this guy. They're, they're called mentors. When I would be guy with guys that would eventually become my mentors, man, I would grill them. I would try and learn everything from these guys because I knew I knew nothing. At least I was aware of the fact. I'm not good at a lot of things, but I am good at knowing where I'm weak, right? which, which gives me a vast breadth of knowledge because you, know, you can't even imagine the weaknesses that I possess. But I know where I'm weak. And when I was 21, I knew how weak I was. So uh, he's not walking into this death wall weak. He says, uh, I had spent seven years honing my rock and ice climbing skills. This guy has some skills. He's bringing the skills to the table. He had acquired a new route experience on the equatorial rock faces of Mount Kenyan, was familiar with the Indonesian bureaucracy as a result of months of wandering in Java and Bali, and Bob was the perfect partner. In addition to being a superb mountaineer, he had excellent third world jail experience. <laughs> uh, so even though I couldn't predict exactly what obstacles and dangers lay around the next turn, I foolishly thought it was likely that together we could figure it out. That to me is what a group like this is all about. I mean, we have no idea what problems are coming around the, around the corner. 
It's all about entrepreneurship. It's problem solving. It's figuring out how to get over that next hurdle. How to figure, there's so many things coming at us that we cannot predict. But he didn't walk in blindly. Lots of skills, lots of experience, and he had a team with him that he knew that between the two of them, they could just figure this stuff out. And uh, that's what it's all about. Great people, great ideas, a lot of passion, and figuring this stuff out. And uh, I have no idea if I said anything interesting at all, but that's all I got, and I'm way past the time. I should have turned this into Q&A anyway. So guys, what do you got? Hey, I think somebody wants to applaud. Jump in there. Join him, please. All right. Um, you guys may have heard the words men's hosiery. You guys know I started a new company? A, a, a sock company. It doesn't sound meaty enough, so I call it a hosiery company. So uh, I was going to start a women's hosiery company, but my wife didn't want me going to the photo shoots. So uh, I can get away with the men's hosiery. You know, we started a sock company. I'm not going to tell you why, because it would take too long. We've got to get to Q&A. But the whole thing about the sock company, it's called Stance, is uh, I hate socks that match. And so uh, we do things like we sell a pair of socks that have nothing to do with each other. So, uh, I mean, if you've got two good looking socks, wear them both, you know? And they, why would you ever want your socks to match? So we even said, wow, let's do three of a kind. So this is a pair of three. So uh, there we go. Now, we actually do do some socks that actually match. We just make sure they don't match anything you've ever bought before. So, uh, stance socks. So, uh, to encourage you to uh, ask the first questions, how about uh, first two good questions? Get, it's got to be a good question. Gets a pair of socks. Bring it. All right. What if you have an idea that's... Do you know how many hands went up before yours? I know you're up in the front. You can't see behind you. Yeah. You it's slow. Okay. There you go. Okay. What if you have an idea that you're not passionate about, but it's a good idea? You don't want to run with it your whole life. You'd rather just get rid of it. Give me the socks back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, why would I possibly want to risk? everything involved in, in starting a business in something I just didn't care about. Exactly. That's the question. It's like, it doesn't sound like a question. It sounds like an answer. It's like, it would be a good investment. Someone would make money on it, but I don't care to move with it. What do you think, Steve? Think do you chase an idea just because it'll I make you money? I think you get one chance to make your first hit. And I think I'd want to do it something I enjoy doing. I'm with you, baby. I'm with you. Uh, if I don't like something, I, listen, I've heard a lot of great ideas. Honestly, there's some great ideas out there in the world. I just thought they were dumb, you know? Uh, they made a lot of money. Uh, I could tell you some great ideas I passed on that have made a ton of money, but I only want to do something I love. What's your name? Corey. Corey? Yes. Corey. Right on, thank you. Pair of three. Right on, pair of three. What you got, Corey? Um, along with the, your, your idea and everything, I mean, I guess my question would be, how many sleepless nights did you, you know, stay awake and, and, and doubt? All of and them. Frustrations and, you know. Okay, well, that was, I apologize. I should wait till the question is through before, uh, before assuming I know where you're going. So uh, it, what, what I thought I was hearing is how many sleepless nights. It's what you're sleepless with. Uh, but what you are saying is how many sleepless nights um, with doubts and fears that this thing's not going to work. For me personally, I don't know that I had a ton of doubtless nights that it wasn't going to work. Because it doesn't matter, you're either in or you're out. If you're in, you better make it freaking work. And so the question was not, I mean listen, we would open up a retailer, and we'd ship them product, and I just felt like, just fingernails on the cliff. Is it going to sell through? Is it going to sell through? Are they going to send it back? Is it going to sell through? And then you wait for the sell through reports. And it's like, oh, Chris, somebody bought that stuff. <laughs> oh, and, and you just rely so many. I would get nervous about sell through. But, uh, and, and that essentially means, did it work? Um, I was spending every night, you know, uh, when I started Skull Candy, I had kind of, I think it was three goals. One was, uh, never work out of my home again. Number two, never live more than 10 minutes from a chairlift again. And number three, never have another employee again. I had sold a business and uh, 
man, the hard parts for me were, was, was managing, not, not managing people, but managing bad people. You know, if you don't have great people, I always say I'm really good at managing really good people. Hey, you're not managing them at all. I mean, if you never want to manage a person again, just hire people that don't need to be managed. You know, hire people that are so good, you don't got to do anything with them because they already got this. You know, so that's, I'd much rather pay way more for somebody that I do not have to worry about. They got this. And then if they don't, you just fire them. You know, but you got to be good at that. That's another full skill set. Hire slow, fire fast. So, uh, but you also got to have a nickel to hire somebody with. And trust me, when we started Skull Candy, there were no nickels to hire anybody with. Um, but I wasn't trying to hire, I was trying to contract. So I saw Skull Candy as this is something I can do virtually. Is that scratching driving you nuts? Because it's kind of driving me crazy. Sorry about that. Um, I thought I could hire manufacturing overseas, hire independent sales reps, hire a third party warehouse system, and just do it all from home. And so, two of my, I'm still pretty close to the chairlifts. That part I got right. The whole never work out of my home again and never hire another employee again, complete failures. Complete failures. I might write a book someday about all the greatest failures of my life. I mean, how fantastic that I failed so badly on those two pieces. But, um, I was doing in the beginning all the ideation, you know, you're having to come up with all the branding and all the, you know, packaging, you're having to do all the, uh, you know, sales, everything involved in starting a business. And you do that kind of from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then you, your kids are home, your wife wants to have dinner, you go in, you have the shortest dinner possible, you have only two or three calls during dinner. You, once the kids are finally to bed, you know, uh, you go right back into the office and that's when China comes online. So about 7, 8 p.m. you go to business with China. And so now it's all the manufacturing, it's where are the samples, uh, you know, where are we on the designs, where are they, what are the engineers doing? And you're about uh, 7, 8 p.m. till about 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning, just working with China. Where's the product? Where's the product? Where's the value? Because you got, you got no product, you got nothing to sell. About 1 or 2 a.m., what happens? Europe comes online. And suddenly you get to deal with all the Europeans because we get, you know, why sell only in this country? All you got to do is uh, ship it. You know, China doesn't care. China's the greatest uh, port in the world. They, they don't care where they ship it. They'll ship it to any place. And so you may as well be selling over there too. And so from about 1 or 2 in the morning till about 4 in the morning, 3 in the morning, you work China, or excuse me, you work Europe. Then you get a couple few hours sleep, get up, try and get the kids off to school, start again. And that went on for a long, a year, year and a half, almost two years of those constant 24 hour sessions. And uh, my wife, I bring up th this point because it's one of the only times that my wife was wrong and I was right. And so I bring it up as often as possible. <laughs> she got after me, she says, you're a workaholic. You can't stop working. I'm saying, listen, I promise you, if I can get somebody to take over the China portion, all I need is somebody to cover China for me. I can take care of Europe and the US. I just need someone to handle China. I need someone to take over manufacturing. When I can get that person, I promise you, I want to be in bed. I've mentioned she's attractive, right? Yes. I'm telling you, that's where I want to be. And it, I'm telling, and she just straight up, she did not believe me. She called me out. She said, you don't know yourself. You are wrong. It doesn't matter. You will find some other way to occupy those same hours doing work some other way. And eventually I got a guy. Uh, by a guy, what I mean is I called my dad. And I said, uh, dad, he's been retired for a couple of years, but he had the skills that I needed. And I said, dude, listen, I just need you for six months, six months. I can pay you nothing. Uh, please, I'm begging you. I need somebody. And he's all in. He's like, yeah, I, I got China for you. Immediately flew him over to China, introduced him to all the factories, got him up to speed. He just owned that thing. And I went home and went to bed. And my wife was wrong. And I started sleeping at night. And it was really cool. It was really, and she fully acknowledged it. It's not just that she was wrong, because how many times has your wife, well, your wife or your woman been wrong and she won't acknowledge it? But she, she owned that one. She knows she was wrong. And that, that's even bigger for me. But uh, no, nah, I was never worried. It was just, it's just a fight. It's just what you do. You just battle. So uh, that's the problem with entrepreneurship. Genuinely, this is a problem that I think that we all have. We will never say, okay, I should quit. 
It's not until all the other resources have died, that all the other people have given up on us, that we've lost all of our money, we've lost our home, we've lost our friends, we've lost our... Everything is gone and it's completely destitute. That finally, we don't give up because the idea was bad. It's just there's nothing left. And you know, if there is anything left, whatever's left was going to haunt you because you should have risked that too. You should have put that up. We're two you, you know, guys that are really entrepreneurs they will go until they die, which is hard because maybe it is a really bad idea. Maybe it is not a marketable product. Maybe there is no demand for it. And you can't trust the people around you because you can ask them questions. Dude, what do you think? Is this thing, and the people that really love you, this whole truth makes, truth is so overrated, man. Truth makes terrible friendships. Nobody's gonna tell you what you really look like in that dress. You know, I mean, <laughs> nobody's really going to tell you that your idea really sucks because they love you. And so you can't, you know you can't trust the people that you love or that love you. And you can't trust the people you don't like because you don't even hardly know them. And if they tell you that the idea wasn't that great, well, they don't really know the idea. They didn't get it anyway. And so, you know, if they tell you it's a great idea, you know you can't trust them because they're just saying that because they like you and they don't have the guts to tell you it's a bad idea. So no matter what it is, you just can't believe the people around you, so stop believing them. It's in your gut. It's either a good one or it's not, and you're either going to succeed or you're not. And guess what? We've all failed before. So if, it, if you thought it was that good, go for it, man. Risk it all. Throw it all down. Put it all down. Lose the house. Lose the cars. Lose your friends. Lose your wife. Lose it all. And because guess what? Start another one. Do another one later, man. But uh, if you don't put that kind of, if you don't put that kind of commitment into it. It's guaranteed to fail anyway. So it's not going to work unless you're all in. So good luck with that. Thank you. Yeah. Two part. What do you think is better, your brand or your product? And then how do you brand your product on a minimal budget? How much time we got? <laughs> I probably should ask that question. Like, how much time do we have? I'll go, because trust me, man, I, I, I can go all night long. So uh, you guys keep walking out, okay? Uh, it, it, this is entrepreneurship, right? You go and you fight until the last person's left, right? And so uh, and guarantee they're not coming in. Um, are you asking about my brand and my product, or are you talking about what's more important, brand, or what's more important, product? Well, let's stick to yours. I mean, because it looks like Stance and School Candy are a similar demographic. Mm -hmm. and to some degree, a similar brand. I mean, it's their it's that brand promise is kind of that same. Like, cool Listen, uh, I stopped growing up the day that I found a skateboard, and that was when I was 13. And uh, I am just still the same 13 year old punk ass kid I was back then, and I just fall harder. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I always say you better be the best version of your own customer. So there's the answer. Who was it that asked if you should go with a profitable idea you don't like? You know, if you're selling to people you don't like, yeah, I would only do something because I knew that customer. But that's really, those are important words. You gotta be the best version of your own customer. If you gotta go out and do market studies and, and uh, what do you call it? You get groups of people together in a room asking questions? Focus groups, yeah, we don't do that. Um, if you got to take focus groups to figure out if your product is appropriate for the person you're trying to sell it to, either you don't know your product or you don't know your customer. But you better know both. And so, yeah, I feel like we know our customer. I feel like we are our customer. You walk anybody? Have any of you ever walked into the Skull Candy offices before? Do we say are our employees our customers? I mean, we are purely who we try to sell to. That's, I mean, everybody skateboards around the office. The whole office is built out to be a skate park. We all get, everybody in the company gets seasons passes up to the canyons because we all want to snowboard. We all want to be outside. We all go mountain biking. You know, we are our customer. Um, you better have fantastic product to survive when your brand is suffering. And you better have fantastic brand to survive when your product is lapsing. And so I don't know that one's more important than the other. But uh, we sure fight hard for both of them. And listen, um, we, had a, we had a real challenge going from building two or 3,000 pair of headphones at a time to building two or 300,000 pair of headphones at a time. And it was not a big gap between can I afford to buy 
I'm looking at my watch. Can I afford to buy? Uh, you should be looking at my wallet. Uh, can I afford to buy 2,000 pair of headphones this month? I mean, that's it. We were literally trying. We, our biggest negotiation with our factories was how small a minimum order quantity we could negotiate with them because we were selling so little in the early days. And it literally went from a 3,000 piece order to a 30,000 piece to a 300,000 piece order in about a year. And, you know, now we'll order, you know, way more than that. We've been super blessed, super fortunate. And by that, what I really mean is unbelievably lucky that, uh, you know, all the different ways that luck has played into this thing. And, uh, you know, you can't just scale produ production from 3,000 pieces to 30,000 pieces to 300,000 pieces and expect your QC to be perfect. You know, your, your on-time shipping is not going to be perfect. Fortunately, our brand was really strong when our product was kind of really beat up. Right now, I'd say we probably have more brand problems than we have production problems because now we've really got that stuff cleaned up. And so it's really critical. And you work them all and you stay passionate about all of it. And uh, I don't know what's more important. I have, don't even really remember the question or if I've answered any of it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got for me? How important do you think the timing? I mean... Oh, dude, everything. When you came out with that idea, hmm. and like I said, you thought... Timing. Let me think this through. I sat on a chairlift in late 90s and said, dude, wouldn't it be a cool idea? I couldn't figure out how to do the product I wanted to do in 2001. So in 2002, I started doing headphones. I'm trying to think, when was the iPod launched? Oh yeah, 2001. And iTunes came out when? Oh yeah, 2003. When did we launch the brand? 2003. Listen, you know, a smart guy can look as bad as I look right now, as soon as you figure out, we're just riding the coattails of Apple. You know, some dude down Cupertino, and you better acknowledge where the luck was and where the timing was. I, I didn't orchestrate freaking Steve Jobs coming out with an iPod at the exact same time I sat on a chairlift. That's the kind of luck you just better get into. I mean, uh, I saw this quote uh, about two months ago from uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, I actually have a photo of it on my phone, but I'm not gonna take the time to pull it out, but it says something Warren Buffett believes in, and it says profit, margin, good people, and above all, luck. I love that the greatest investor of all time says his greatest thing above all, he believes in luck. And I'm telling you, any of you that think that anybody that's ever had any kind of success that didn't succeed on luck and, and activating on the luck that comes at them, we have a thing at Skull Candy, we call it planned spontaneity. You know, you had better be ready. You had better plan for every good thing that you have no idea is coming around the corner. Because for all the problems you don't see coming around, there's just as many great opportunities coming around the corner. And you better be able to solve the problems so you can take advantage <coughs> of the opportunities. And uh, so we really believe in planned spontaneity. Luck's a huge thing. Timing, luck, come on, everything. Uh, my partner and I met you in 2003 when you had the 10 by 20, and as our business was sliding, yours was growing, and the next time I looked, you had a 60 by 60 down at CES. Can you just walk through setting aside the look? How I got the, from the one to the other? That would probably take more two, time well, than we got. I mean, what were, the, what were two or three key things that happened between 2003 and 2008 that had you mm -hmm. grow the way you did? And did, who did you meet? Did you have marketing firms? I mean, what, was, what were the keys? Uh, there's no marketing firm. You know, again, you either know your customer or you don't know your customer. And I totally understand that marketing firms are good because not everybody can be stuck, in, you know, at the maturity level of a 13-year-old and sell only to 13-year-olds, you know. And so I, I feel very lucky to have been stunted that way. Um, but the, uh, I, you know, I think it would be difficult to say, these were the major things. I can sit and say, oh yeah, the day that Musicland uh, bought us in, the first non-snowboard skateboard shop, the first consumer electronics shop that said, yeah, you know something, this could be something. I'm going to buy some headphones from these snowboard guys. You know, the day that Best Buy, you know, and Circuit City and Target bought from us, those are big things. But I don't believe that businesses... I don't believe that, at least in my experience, <clears throat> Success is not these single big home runs. Nobody's hitting home runs out there. It's how many singles can you hit? You know, it's all about the little successes. Every little problem that comes around the corner, you solve the little ones. Every little opportunity you have, you execute on the little ones. We would not have Jay-Z today 
if we hadn't randomly had an idea to do a thing with, you guys ever heard of a band, uh, believe it or not, the music is really good and they're just the nicest guys in the world. And in a room like this, it's hard to say the name of the band with a straight face, but there's a band out of Canada called Swollen Members. It's a great band. <laughs> they're really solid guys and they happen to be in the office and they were coming out with, a, with an album. And uh, we looked at the album graphics and we just said, oh, this is the coolest looking album. I mean, it's just, it, it, you know, guys are putting out vinyl. It's a, it's a you know, a, a hip hop group and they're putting out vinyl. And I'm just looking at the vinyl graphics and I'm just saying, they're so beautiful. We should put those on a pair of headphones. And then we thought, hey man, we should put this on a pair of headphones and release a pair of Swollen Member headphones with the album and we'll put them in the retail. And they're like, hey man, because uh, we'd like to sell albums in places you're selling headphones and we love to sell headphones where you're playing, uh, selling albums. And we did this collab and that started this idea, hey, we should do this stuff with musicians. And then that led, you know, from Swollen Members to Snoop Dogg to, you know, everybody in between all the way up to Jay-Z, you know, getting higher than Jay-Z. And so it's those little ones. We didn't go out and get Jay-Z one day. You know, we, we did all the little things along the way. So uh, I, I don't know if, if I'm right. It's just my experience. Can you tell us about your financing? How did you did that? Uh, sold a binding company and uh, it was either 99 or 2000, and made a little bit of money. Uh, by little, I mean just a little, really a little, but it was enough to pay off my house and uh, put a little bit of money in the bank. And uh, so let me back up. My first business in 1986, National Snowboard Incorporated, um, I call it the first government bailout. I literally needed $2,000 to start that business because my partner, he had $2,000 and I didn't. And I had a, uh, 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 Pell Grant for my uh, for my college that came in that was like two thousand and thirty six dollars and so my first financing was I put my Pell Grant check into this business which would have supposed to have made more money so you know that's the kind of logic a guy has when he's twenty one that I can make way more money off of this two thousand dollars than giving it to the university I'll put it into this business randomly it worked and so that business did well and we sold that thing for more money than I had ever seen before in my life it was like. 60,000 bucks, you know, we sold this company for like this much, but we had a good earn out and stuff. And that money, that was the money when we sold that business, that's how we started the binding company. That was enough for me to get tooling for the first set of bindings that we built. And so we went out, raised more money, we started this binding company and we ran this binding company. We sold that to a real company. We actually made a reasonable amount of money, not tons. I mean, it wasn't the kind of money that you don't have to keep working. I mean, that desperation for the next project was still pretty high for me. But I had a little bit of money in the bank from having sold the previous business. So that went into starting Skull Candy. I was able to live on that money. I think I had said that I had paid off my house. About a year and a half, two years into Skull Candy, I was tapped. Any money that we had was out. Everything was gone. There was nothing left, and nobody's going to give me money for this thing. And that's when I had to go to my wife and say, uh, "Yo, honey, uh, do you mind if I put a mortgage on the house?" I mean, that was a really hard conversation, and she nailed it. I mean, uh, I, if you've heard me present, I say this a lot, so you've probably heard this story before. But my wife, I mean, that was a hard question. It's a big deal for us. We was a, we've always had this dream. If you've ever paid off a house, I always say outside of family and sex, nothing has ever felt so good as paying off your house. Pay off your freaking house. You just cannot imagine how free you feel when your house is paid off. And then to go to my wife and say, uh, can I put a mortgage on the house? Um, but that was the only way to keep the thing alive. And she just, right off the cuff, just standing in the living room, I could walk you right to the tile that she was standing on when she says, you know something? What's the worst that could happen? We lose the house, we lose the cars, we move into a small apartment, we start all over again. That's not that big a deal. We've done that before, go for it. It's like, you know, that's how we finance the business. That's where it got off the ground. And so, you know, the follow up, kind of the, if you ever meet my wife, that's how good this girl is. Now tell me I don't have a problem trying to keep this woman, you know? <laughs> so uh, about a year later, as I always say, uh, the first mortgage felt so good, we put another one on, you know? Uh, <laughs> And about three years later, we paid them both off and I was cash free again because the company grew and it did what it was supposed to do. So the Pell Grant paid off, the mortgages paid off, and you know, they don't always, I could tell you the stories, they're way more painful. I can tell you the stories where they didn't pay off and where we ended up without the money and the business didn't work. Because if you don't have those stories, you don't know how to avoid those problems. The first time you got to call an investor and tell them, 
you know something? Dude, you trusted me. You thought I could. I thought I could. I couldn't. And uh, you know that money you gave me? It's not coming back. Uh, that's a hard call. I assume I'm, I'd like to think I'm not the only, I would like to think I'm the only person that's ever had to make that call, but I assume in this many entrepreneurs, I'm not the only guy that's lost somebody else's money before. It's a hard call. You make that call and you'll never want to do that again. You want to talk about desperation, desperation to never have to make that call again. You work, you'll do everything, never have to make that call again. And uh, it worked this time. It, we got super lucky, you know. Thank you for all losing your headphones. Thank you for all letting your dog chew on them and you need a new pair. For leaving them at home when you went to the airport and you need a pair for the flight. Thank you for all the reasons that you needed. How did the word need come in front of the word headphones? You know, uh, <laughs> but for anybody that's ever bought headphones, uh, God bless you. Thank you very much. But uh, I got to believe we're way out of time, right? Tell me we're out. We'll, we'll run her down. Yeah. We'll run her down. Guys, uh, is there uh, two more? We got two more. Go. What you got? Uh, now that you're a public company. I am? Well, that's what kind of what kind of I feel public a little bit sometimes. Yeah. What, what are the greatest challenges you see now, particularly with uh, what's happening with all that? That's what every public company sees is uh, growth. You know, uh, the only thing people buy is growth. You know, uh, Yvonne Chouinard, if you've ever read his book, uh, it's a, I, one that I highly recommend. It's called Let My People Go Surfing. You know, he says, when, when did we say that a really successful company is not big enough? You know, how much growth do we, why can't we just say, $200 million a year is enough. We've got a bunch of people employed. We've got really good profit. Why can't we just stay at $200 million a year? You know, that's not enough. It, they, nobody buys flat. Nobody's going to invest in a company that's flat. It's all about growth. And so it's all about acquisition. It's all about, you know, you, you living your life quarter to quarter. You know, we got an earnings call May 2nd coming up. And so, you know, living your life around a, a, an earnings call every three months, it's all about growth. And so, yeah, you know, that's the big concern. If, if, I'm, if I'm reading into your question right, that's the big concern with being public now is, you know, can we keep feeding the growth? Because we have been quoted. You never know what people are going to say in the world. You know, we've been quoted in uh, in high schools and in colleges as the coolest brand in the world. We've had some magazines say the coolest brand in the world, and we've had the Wall Street Journal call us the most hated stock on on Wall Street. You know, that's hard. I mean, of all of them, nobody's hated more than ours. <laughs> you took a poll, and the one that they said we hate more than everybody else. It's Alden's, you know? I mean, that's when it feels real personal. Yeah, so we've been quoted as the most hated stock on Wall Street. That's rough, man, but you know, at least we're climbing back out. You know, it's going the right direction. But yeah, it's growth and watching that thing go. Now we got everybody in our shorts, but hey, we signed up for it. It's just, it's the world that you know, we said, yeah, we want to be talked about like that. So uh, we knew what we were getting into. We uh, had no, no shockers. I'm gonna go one more here, right here. What you got? I can stay ahead of the game being the coolest company in the world when you got so many copycats from out of Woodward. Dude, how many headphone companies have popped up? Um, I got an email two days ago. I could read you the email, my response to it. Um, guys, I've never, I'm proud to say I have never seen Jersey Shore. <laughs> what's, the, what's, the, what's the weird chicks on uh, Jersey Shore? Snooky. Yeah, I'm sorry. I guess it's probably a little too targeted, but Snooky came out with a pair of headphones. Consumer Electronics Shows, we showed up. snooky has got a line of headphones out. Everybody and their dog has got a line of headphones out. And I guess if snooky has got them, the email I got two days ago says that a dude named The Situation now wants a line of headphones. You know, but Dre's got them in 50s, got them in Ludacris has got them, and you know, fortunately, you know, Snoop and 50 are with us. And everybody and their dog. It's like, if you can't think of anything else to do, start a headphone company. Um, everybody's doing it. Fortunately, you know what they say, you know, imitation is a great form of flattery, something like this. And, for, and people say, you know, we kind of started this thing, you know, we started making headphones cool, and that's great. But uh, listen, our, you know, we've, we, there's one company that's doing an amazing job, Beats. I mean, those guys killing it, killing it. I mean, we completely missed the boat on some of that stuff. We're still bigger than them. We're still growing faster. You know, I don't know if we're growing faster, but you know, we have our strengths and they have their strengths. And now we are having to play catch up with those guys in some places. I mean, man, it's rough there. We have 
I'd say one good headphone company out there that we're really trying to chase, and it's, it's Beats, they're killing us. So uh, there's a lot to that, but at least we recognize the fact that, wow, we, we get some, uh, got some catch-up to do here. Um, there are some places where we're still leading. We still have, uh, you know, we have one pair of earbuds. It's the, the number one selling earbud in the world. Yeah, hey, listen, I'll take the I hate your stock all day long as long as what I've got is the number one selling earbud in the world. One puts money in my pocket and the other one just makes my friends think, hey man, you doing okay? You gonna be all right? <laughs> you got anything sharp in your pockets? You know, I mean, it doesn't really hurt me. It hurts with the stock price, but you know, the revenues are great. You know, we're still growing. We're still, 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 we haven't stopped growing yet. So uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a whole different world. Guys, thank you for uh, sitting through it. Good luck, whatever you're doing, good luck with it. Go for a few minutes. Just for a few minutes, you got a minute.